creating the interventions. So we want to think more about how can we actually stimulate and encourage innovation among the people that are using this. Uh, some of you may know about a, uh, a, 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 a knowledge sharing um, technique called horizontal learning. And in 2007, in Bangladesh, they, invent, uh, they applied horizontal learning to a critical problem that affect water supply in Bangladesh, which is that of arsenic screening. So 66 union parishads, which are the local governments in Bangladesh, got together to discuss how they could actually have, which of, the, which of these local governments had the best and most cost-effective ways to do arsenic screening above these water points. And uh, during this discussion, uh, there was a pay-for-use arsenic screening methodology that was identified. Now, in horizontal learning, it is the information exchange is not about, well, you are doing this wrong, or you're doing this inadequately, and therefore, let me teach you how to do it. It was the 66 union parishads that got together and said, oh, what behaviors work? What, kind, what were the newest ideas that you're using in your local government? And maybe I can learn something. And here are some exciting things that we're doing in our local governments. So it's really a peer-to-peer -peer sharing information using techniques such as appreciative inquiry. Well, the results were pretty dramatic. Because out of that session, immediately 51 union parishads adopted this arsenic screening methodology and got enough interest in terms of the rapid scale-up of this technology that uh, JICA funded a project, a, a three-year project. During the course of this three-year project, 2,500 water points were screened with arsenic. But that's not even the most important thing. After the JICA project ended, the local governments in Bangladesh went on to use that same methodology to screen water points using their own expenses, and to date, 80,000 water points in the country have been tested without external funding. So this is really the power of sharing information and innovation among themselves. But there are lots of exciting innovations in this, that, in, in this sector that we don't even know. Uh, you may have heard about uh, the Water for Carbon project that is being designed by Vestergaard Franzen in Kenya. Under this project, clean water filters are be giving, being given to rural water communities in Kenya. And the theory is that without having to boil water, there is a reduction in carbon offsets. About 2.5 million carbon credits are uh, expected to be saved as a result of this project. And Kenyans, will, about 4 million Kenyans, will have access to improved water. How can we learn more about this project? But not from the company. Let's actually get information from the people that are using the project and experiencing the project, and how fast that type of information can scale up. Now, I've talked to you about scale, but I know that there's another issue that you're very interested in here, which is sustainability. So do these three, three concepts apply also in sustainability? Well, in uh, the field of sanitation, we can't study sustainability without, try, without studying what happened in Bangladesh, which is widely acknowledged as the birthplace of community-led total sanitation. The Water and Sanitation Program is about to release a study on the effectiveness of sustainability of open defecation-free behavior in Bangladesh. The methodology was simple. Uh, we, uh, the, about 481 union parishads in Bangladesh had been declared ODF. And we took a sample of about 12% of them, about 53 union parishads, five years after they had been declared ODF, to say how many, what percentage of these communities are still ODF today. I won't keep you in suspense. The result was 89%. I think that's fantastic news, not only for sanitation, not only for Bangladesh, but in this field of economic development, having 89% sustainability five years afterwards. Now, how did Bangladesh maintain this momentum? Let's go back to the same principles again. First, uh, ongoing program at scale. This was a pro, the total sanitation campaign in Bangladesh was a campaign that swept through the entire country. It was led by the Minister of Local Government, but it involved everybody. 
Central government, local government, NGOs, donors, community leaders, everybody was involved. And in fact, it was a, a, uh, was a shift from previous programs in Bangladesh in that it wasn't that NGOs were allowed to operate. The minister actively sought NGOs as partners to the program. He went from Union Parishad to Union Parishad, visiting communities, explaining what open defecation does and what the uh, impact of open defecation free environments were, and celebrated everybody who was able to reach that. And I think this was very, very important. The second thing about running a, a program at scale is you can't have a complicated message. So the message in Bangladesh was not how do we build latrines, it was how to confine feces from the environment. So the government of Bangladesh was actually fairly relaxed on the method that was used. In fact, they didn't even insist that it had to be a certain type of total sanitation. If NGOs wanted to use a certain methodology or, um, or donors wanted to use a certain methodology or communities, they were fairly relaxed about it because the goal was to confine feces from the environment, not to figure out what type of a latrine is the best to construct and how many latrines were constructed. So it was really looking at how do you design a program at scale. The second was to target resources. Were resources needed? Yes, absolutely. 11% of the, of the population received subsidies because these were considered the ultra poor. They received subsidies to construct latrines. But the rest of the information was not really on the construction of latrines, but it was on uh, promoting the, uh, the information exchange and awarding incentives to the communities as a whole, not to individual households. Um, and the third is innovation. There was fantastic innovation, as I, uh, as I mentioned, in terms of innovations, in terms of different types of community education and targeting and definition of total sanitation. But there was also innovation that emerged from the domestic private sector. Uh, until they had uh, these pit latrines and when the basic concept of having pans and so on were introduced, immediately there was production of plastic pans that, re that reduced the cost from about $10 to about $3. Not only that, but new professions emerged. People changed their jobs because they found out that actually becoming a pit latrine cleaner turned out to be much more lucrative and with certain types of pumping, uh, pumping equipment, you didn't actually even have to touch the, tr the latrine. So there was a lot of innovation which created also economic benefit for the members of the, members of the community. So these three concepts are really important, I think, for us to keep in mind, to step back a little, because we get so tendency to think about each of our technical programs, how will we design it, how is it going to impact the community that we're working on. But in each time, we can also step back and say, how are these three principles applied in our program? Am I going to be looking at the, the impact in this community in the perspective of the larger global effort? In 1995, I was on the supervision team of the last World Bank loans to Korea. And those were the Seoul Sewerage Project, the Pusan Sewerage Project, and the Gwangju Sewerage Project. But a lot has changed in the last 15 years. Korea is today the 14th largest economy in the world. And children in Korea today can't believe that their country was ever considered a developing country. I think the reason that we're all in this room today is because we want children in the world to forget that there was ever a need for clean water and sanitation. Thank you. <laughs>